The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. My name is Pei Dong Sun, Distinguished Associate Professor of Arts and Science in China and the Asian Pacific Studies and an Associate Professor of History at Cornell. I'm pleased to host the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series for the autumn of 2022. The series is connected to two courses I'm teaching this semester, F Fashion and the Politics in 20th Century China and the Life and the Death in China on the map. We have been fortunate to have had three distinguished speakers this semester in the last two months. They are historian Jeff Wurststrom from UC Irvine, Australia historian Antonia Finan from the University of Melbourne, and the sociologist Deborah Davis from Yale University. Today we welcome our last speaker of this season, uh, season Italian anthropologist uh, Simona Seg Renard. She flew far away from Milano and arrived in Ithaca two days ago. Now it's my great honor and the privilege to introduce our speaker. Professor Renak is an Associate Professor of Fashion Studies at the University of Bologna. She's also a fashion curator. She, was she has written extensively on fashion from a global perspective in the books such as The Fashion History Reader, Fashion Media, Past and the Present, a cultural history of dress and fashion, and the Cambridge Global History of Fashion, and so forth. Her research field work includes China and Italy regarding Sino-Italian collaborations in the context of global fashion. She will tell us more about her recent publications in her talk. In addition, she is a member of various editorial boards or advisory boards of presses or academic journals, such as uh, Bloomsbury Publishing, Fashion Theory, and the Critical Studies of Fashion and uh, Beauty. She's also Editor-in-Chief of Zona Moda Journal. Uh, founded in 2009, Zona Moda Journal is the first uh, Italian journal dedicated to fashion research uh, in its com complexity, aesthetic, social, cultural, economic, and histor uh, hist historical. The title of today's talk lecture is Sino-Italian Encounters in Global Fashion, 20 Years of Collaborations. Professor Renak will talk for about uh, 40 minutes or one hour, and then we will ask her questions during the following section of Q&A. Uh, in addition, please allow me to say a few words about uh, housekeeping. Uh, please turn off your iPhone, cell phone, and do not log on on Zoom if you are in this conference room. We are recording this and uh, we'll post it online within a few days. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Simona Seth Renick. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Pedon, for this lovely introduction. Good afternoon to everybody. And thank you for having me today. And especially I wish to thank Pei Dong Sun for a much appreciated invitation and Amal Alain for her assistance and guidance in my journey from Milano to Ithaca. It is a great honor for me to participate in the Cornell Contemporary China Initiatives. The title of my talk is Sino-Italian Encounters in Global Fashion, 20 Years of Collaborations. Before showing you some images, mostly from the fieldwork, I would like to give you a short background of the research. Um, the accelerated production relocation in past decades has irrevocably changed the geography of fashion as well as the rhetoric of the origin of national creativity. But what happens when two or more players are engaged in the making of fashion? 
and specifically what happens when Italy and China collaborate in the transglobal fashion making? How does one account for the creativity that has sprung from the Sino-Italian co-creation? My talk discusses the intricacy of Sino-Italian collaborations in the past 20 years and the implications of such a fashion co-creation. It then reflects on the transglobal fashion making. A few words on the history and methodology of the research. I started researching Italian-Chinese relations in 2001. I made several trips to China until 2008-2010 as part of the Fabricating Transnational Capitalism project with anthropologists Silvia Yanagisako and Lisa Rofel, collaborating with them as a fashion scholar. We conducted face-to-face -face interviews with participants in Italian-Chinese joint ventures in China mainly in Shanghai and the Yangtze Delta region, and in northern and central Italy, th the Como silk industry, Milano and Prato. Repeatedly, over the years, managers, owners, intermediaries, translators, Yanagisako and I for the Italian side, and Rofel for the Chinese side. On the subject, I have published several articles, including an initial article in 2005, Fast Fashion versus Preto Porté, which was on fashion theory, up to the contribution of a chapter entitled One Fashion, Two Nations, Italian-Chinese Collaborations, in the book Fabricating Transnational Capitalism by y uh, Rofel and Yanagisako at the end of the research. Later on, in 2019-2020, I continue my research on fashion collaborations independently by studying new cases. I was interested in adding to the transformation of collaborations between Italians and Chinese in the new global fashion. I wrote about it in two recent articles Fashion Making and the Co-Creation in a Transglobal Landscape with Wesley Lin, and From Joint Ventures to Collaborative Projects Toward an Ethnography of Sino-Italian Fashion Relations in the 2020s in a Fashion Theory Special Issue, which is this one, entitled Global China, which was edited by Wesley Lin and by myself. But back to the beginnings 20 years ago by now, in the introduction of the book, Fabricating Transnational Capitalism, Yanagisako and Rofel delve into the theme of ethnographic collaborations, a type of research that they, that they pioneered. The mutual expertise, in fact, allowed us during the fieldwork to scrutinize the same reality from different points of view, that of the Italians and that of the Chinese, who, at different levels, were engaged in different fashion production projects. Many of the beliefs of the Italian about the Chinese approach to fashion could be ascribed to a fantasized separation between the material and the immaterial sides of fashion, that is, between conception and execution, as in the early 20s, a Eurocentric vision of fashion still prevailed. But even the same research object, the global fashion, is in fact a result of the collaborations, as we shall see, and constant negotiations and conflict between the Chinese and the Italians. We now live in a fashion world that can be defined as polycentric. It is not just about geography trajectory, though. Much has changed, both in the relations between the parties in the characteristics of the collaboration and the type of fashion made. So I will show to you now what I found when I was on the field in the beginning of the 2000. Already the semiosis of Italian fashion in China 
I would say that Italian fashion has various forms in China because it is simultaneously a discourse, a product, and a brand. As a discourse, it permeates the design, the manufacturing, and the global saying, sale of Italian clothing, including those produced by collaborations. But as a product, Italian fashion includes a range of different objects. Some are imported or made in China, but most, however, are hybrid products, as we will see. Also, Italian fashion inspires Italian sounding brands. I'll give you some examples like Giordano, a brand from Hong Kong which in, with an Italian sounding name, Captaino, which would, should be Capitano, Captain, <laughs> and also want to recall something from Italy, and this is also from Hong Kong. Or Vero Moda, this oh. is a Swedish, uh, Swedish uh, brand, and uh, in, uh, in English we say true fashion, and again, it's nothing to do uh, with uh, 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 Italy in this case, it's just a sound. You might expect uh, that this was just 20 years ago, but on my uh, more recent uh, uh, journey for the presentation of the book, I found this more or less the same situation. This is Farrograno, which should be Ferragamo, <laughs> the, 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 the shoe, and Lamavo, which is a name, it means I used to love her or love him, and is the name of, of a brand. And again, Senso Unico, which uh, translates into one way. So, um, in fact, uh, uh, the, the idea of sounding Italian is still something that uh, uh, has, uh, is, is part uh, of uh, the Italian fa fashion semiosis in, uh, in China. Uh, and also, and this is uh, precisely what I will be talking about, Italian fashion is an implicit component, of course, of the Chinese brands that were made uh, really in Sino-Italian joint ventures for the Chinese market that were the object of, of, our, or of our, our research. Um, to understand uh, uh, the, the very complicated intricacy of these relationships, I found interesting to focus on three main points. Uh, we can consider these points from a temporal point of view, but you should take into account uh, this, that uh, the three uh, modalities were all uh, simultaneously present uh, when we did the, uh, the research. But according to the focus, it changes the relationship and also the conflicts or the non-conflict. So, it really was very helpful for me to find uh, uh, this different uh, uh, focus. The first one is on sourcing. Sourcing, it means Italians going to China to find products, to find um, material, to find uh, manufacturing, something that uh, was less uh, uh, expensive than the made in Italy and should have a certain kind of quality. Um, the second one is making fashion together. This is really the beginning of the period of the joint ventures, which lasted not very much, 10 years, then they are all gone. And this uh, is also uh, starting to put together the material and the immaterial values of fashion. Whereas in the sourcing, it was just the materiality. The third one is something that is still going on, of course, is about branding. So it's mainly about the immaterial side uh, of the fashion production. This is a picture, a photograph that I like a lot, uh, and this was taken um, in a silk uh, factory, and it was really about uh, uh, the sourcing trying to find a good product, something that uh, could be used by the Italians to make uh, a certain products that the Chinese didn't even know 
uh, uh, what uh, they were, uh, what the final product would have been. And of course, it involves uh, the sourcing by the Italians, a deep knowledge of the territory, something very difficult to find in the beginning, the beginning, the end of, uh, say, half of the 90s. Uh, uh, Italians went there without knowing anything. And it had a kind of pioneer type vision of China. And uh, the Chinese, in this case, uh, were considered allied by the Italians, although in a relation of disparity. Why I'm saying disparity? Because the Chinese, in that case, didn't know really what the product would have been at the end. And to make this more understandable, I think that the best thing is to give you some taste um, of uh, the uh, interviews uh, I uh, made uh, during this period. I found accommodation in a house, dirt, dump, mosquitoes. My childhood came to my rescue. There were children without shoes, as I had been in Friuli, which is a, was a very poor region in Italy. The Chinese observed me. They observed my body hair, which they don't have. They shared the little they possessed. I fell in love with these people. I fell in love with them. This is what an Italian entrepreneur very old told me about uh, this first journey. And you can feel the kind of relationship that it was there. Oh, this is another one. In many respects, the Chinese are like us. They have affections and feelings and wish to be loyal. Knowing the right firm is the most difficult information to obtain. It takes years and years to create a network of firms to work with. This is another, uh, another one, an Italian manager in, in Shanghai. And the last sentence is also very interesting. In our turn, we have transmitted to the Chinese a way of thinking which for them was completely unknown. We taught them everything. So there is a, a, a kind of relationship that uh, I um, have ascribed to this um, fantasized period of uh, just sourcing. The second one uh, is about uh, uh, making fashion together. And so this is precisely the beginning of uh, the proper Sino-Italian joint ventures. And here, there are other issues uh, that uh, come about. Uh, it is uh, taste, design, assembling and collections, not just quality, not just finding the best product, but uh, the second step, so to speak, uh, to produce uh, fashion. And this is, uh, um, what I called uh, uh, making uh, uh, fashion together. Uh, I now will uh, uh, give you uh, another quote, which is very interesting. Um, if you Chinese had ability, creativity, and good taste, you would own the world. And this is not just a paradox, because it reveals the correlation between recognized creativity and international relevance. It both states and denies the fact that Chinese could and in fact had become rivals, also in a matter of taste. So in the beginning, there were not uh, there was an, a real problem apart the difficulties of finding the people to source. But now, uh, problem uh, arise because uh, the party, China, want to acquire recognitions. And this squares up to the Italians' intent of conserving, conserving it. Um, a lawyer uh, that we interviewed at the time said uh, uh, that uh, the joint ventures um, could be best described with this uh, uh, Chinese saying, same bed, different dreams. Uh, this was about marriage, but a joint venture, it is a kind of, of marriage. And, and, and you can see the two focus. Um, we surrender our know-how, but in exchange, 
we got the chance of a very well functioning factory. On the other hand, the Chinese of the same joint venture said, we are not just producing for them, we have a brand. So here you can see the, that the conflict might, might arise because there is a confliction by the fact that for the Italians, they were just a site of production. They shouldn't really uh, bother about uh, other things, uh, uh, just uh, um, make a good product. But uh, they, this was not what the uh, Chinese side of the joint venture thought because they uh, um, started, wanted to have a brand to make, uh, uh, to make fashion. And uh, uh, in, uh, in this, um, in this uh, mode of the making fashion together, of course, uh, it started an essentializing of, of the made in Italy. No? And uh, at this point, uh, uh, it started all the idea that creativity is something you're born with, uh, you're born with, you can't be taught. Italians have fashion in their DNA and all this kind of thing, the Renaissance, uh, uh, the, uh, the essentializing a fact and putting outside the history, you know, in a way. And uh, from unwitting allies, the Chinese have become witting rivals at this point. Um, I give you some, uh, um, especially two uh, different joint ventures, one for men's wear and the other for women's wear. These are uh, Chinese uh, factory, Chinese uh, company that was were founded in 1992. And they went in joint ventures with Italians uh, in 2003 and the joint ventures ended in 2005. So the period of the joint ventures is basically this one. No? Then the tensions became uh, too strong and the joint ventures uh, disappeared. So this was uh, one. The, uh, uh, this was uh, the other one we study, Elegant Prosper. Again, this was founded in 1988 became a joint venture with a big group in Italy in 2004 and ended in 2015. We don't, we, we don't have time, but if you go to the website of the Elegant Prosper, there is all the history of uh, the brand and you won't even find the mention of the period uh, in which they were a joint venture with uh, uh, an Italian uh, uh, company, not at all. Mm -hmm. And the same for the other one, you won't find any mention with this. The third the focus is, uh, is branding and there are some differences here already. For the Chinese, it was seeking independence from their foreign clients because you have to think that uh, uh, they uh, wanted uh, to be part of the global fashion world. And to do this, uh, you need to have a brand, but not an Italian sounding brand, uh, a proper brand. And so uh, this, uh, uh, is, um, this is a period uh, uh, in which um, Italian sand um, and Chinese um, had to change their kind of, of collaboration. Uh, by the time uh, uh, branding meant uh, really, this is, was um, an important uh, exhibition by Salvatore Ferragamo at the Mocha Museum in Shanghai in 2008. And in this uh, uh, exhibition, Ferragamo explained history, the past, uh, uh, everything about a, a kind of essentialization of the Made in Italy. And it's interesting because this exhibition marked the, was the first one, then every, now it's very easy to find exhibition on heritage. Uh, it's very common, but this was the first one and they started in China. And then this exhibition went to Milano, to New York, to London, but it was set up in China and for China. So it's really an interesting turning point. 
they had uh, uh, the Ciabattino, the shoemaker making shoes during the exhibition and the whole thing about uh, uh, the artisan kind of uh, skills, Italian artisan skills started uh, precisely with this uh, exhibition. And also fashion had become a social field of desire. This is another um, exhibition at the Beijing National Museum of China in 2011 by Bulgari and other brand, uh, uh, which is jewels, but related to fashion. And this is what an Italian manager um, told me once. I don't know any brand that it isn't made in China. But we shouldn't really take this literally in the sense that it is manufactured there, because there are very many ways, apart from the joint ventures, in which the Chinese helped the Italians uh, to uh, gain power in, in, uh, in fashion in this time of globalization. Um, I want to rapidly uh, see with you some of the contributions that uh, Chinese uh, have done to the Made in Italy. Uh, one is um, um, the sub subcontracting. It means what subcontracting? It means uh, that uh, there are companies uh, in, uh, in Italy that didn't have uh, a, a great uh, name. They just, uh, like this one, Baldassari, he was producing uh, garments for Giorgio Armani, that's it. But when uh, they decided to try the Chinese uh, way, uh, it became a brand. So it was in China, it was recognized as a made in Italy brand. In fact, it was all made in, made in, uh, made in China. And this is an, an interesting example. Another one is a, a brand that were designed precisely in, for, uh, for the Chinese uh, uh, market. This is a Foral Group, it's an Italian, in joint venture with Ningbo, and they invented this brand, Marco Azzali, just for the uh, Chinese uh, uh, market. Or the other way around. This is an importer of Chinese uh, silk. Just by the end of the 70s, they, they started really very, very early and importing, and uh, uh, they were just, um, uh, selling to other companies, but they decided to become a brand, uh, in, in this case, in Italy, Blue Nauta is an Italian brand uh, with Chinese um, origin. Uh, another uh, interesting point is the negotiation for the positioning of the brands in the uh, in malls, no, in the Asian market. Because one might think that uh, just the selling fashion in China is about going there and putting a brand, or a, no, it is not like this. Because the um, the cons some consolidated position in Europe can easily be overturned in China. And so here, the crucial role of malls, selecting the, good, the, the, the mall, which is uh, the right one for you, the city, the area, the floor, the neighboring brands, because it's a kind of alphabet that should be put together. So a brand cannot stand together to another one um, if it is not of the same level. So you have to reconstruct the uh, global uh, map in, uh, in Asia. In order to do so, you need the Chinese facilitators and developers, especially this was uh, up to 2010, I would say, was really, um, really very in, important. Uh, okay, this is what an Italian manager told me that, uh, um, it's really important to have the good developer for the mall. And also these very good factories uh, that were manufacturing for Italian brands in China were also a place where other less relevant uh, Italian brands 
could learn what were the trends because if you go in the um, in China in the factory where say Louis Vuitton or Gucci are manufactured then you learn what are the new trends if you are a small company in Italy so again this is a, an occasion uh, in which uh, uh, Italians uh, could profit from Chinese fashion. So the global luxury map is not and never was a straightforward translation of the West in Asia, but always a matter of uh, um, negotiations at various kinds. And now um, I wanted to show to you uh, what kind of new collaborations uh, are about now. So we, we have seen that the joint ventures properly uh, made, uh, all of them finished by the 2015, more or less. And now what are the collaborations? And I mm, will tell you about uh, JADA, which is a very interesting case. Jade, I would say, is a kind of nomen omen because you will see that it wasn't started for the Chinese market, but it became a Chinese brand. Um, the turn of the century was a period of frantic consulting activities for Italian practitioners, and most of them made their way to China as consultants, as fashion designers, as textile providers. So everybody wanted to try China at this point. There is a woman called uh, uh, Rosanna Daolio. She was uh, a seamstress at Max Mara. Max Mara is a big uh, company uh, in Italy. And uh, she didn't have any training. She was just the kind of person who started uh, kind of 30 years ago and then made a career within Max Mara. At a certain point in 2000, she decided to leave Max Mara. She wanted to start her own thing. And she started with consulting, but then she wanted to have a brand. And she founded this brand called Jada, which might sound something interesting for China, but in fact, um, she just launched it and tried to, uh, she really wanted to meet some Chinese to help her because by uh, 2002, two years after the founding of the brand, the brand, she didn't have enough uh, financial support to carry on. And she said, I want to meet some Chinese. And people told her, but you don't speak Chinese. You don't speak English. You don't speak French. You just speak Italian. You're not a global person. You cannot do anything with your job. And she said, no, I want, I desperately want to meet a, a Chinese. And in fact, uh, eventually she did. She went to Paris to buy some textile for her brand. And she met uh, Mr. Zhao from Redstone Luxury Group, a huge Chinese group that started as importer of Italian brands in China. I don't know how they um, managed to understand each other, but uh, in, uh, in the language of fashion, probably. And by uh, 2005, um, they signed an agreement. He said, OK, I uh, will finance your Jada, but you have uh, to, um, to stay with me and just me not doing consultancy with others. And I will uh, uh, make your Jada um, grow. Uh, so the agreement uh, was, uh, was done. I just um, uh, reported here some pieces of the interview and you, uh, we cannot read them all, I think, but uh, I want to read the second one. Uh, because in 2002, it is where um, they started working together. No? And she said that we presented in a hotel, because at the time fashion was presented in a hotel, uh, the first Jada collection to the shop managers who would buy for their stores, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Hangzhou. I asked for a model girl to wear the clothes. 
it doesn't matter the answer. Use the hunger in your hand. I freaked. I started screaming like crazy. We are not selling carrots, <laughs> onions, or potatoes. And uh, she, uh, she said, but they went along very well. And uh, this is not my interview. I found it on the internet and I think it's interesting. She said, they were thinking in terms of individual garments. I was envisioning a whole collection. So again, you see the translation from, uh, not the translation, the passage from the material to the immaterial. But uh, to, to make a long story short, they succeeded really very well. And Mr. Zhao from Redstone was an importer of luxury brands in China, Ferragamo, Saint Laurent, Valentino. And when they met, he had the idea of having his own Italian brand. So the two really went together very well. And in, from 2005 to 2013, Jada opened more than 50 luxury stores in China. But Chinese think that Jada is Italian. So an Italian brand should be present in Italy. And until 2013, Jada wasn't there, was, was only in China. So he decided to open the first store in the luxury district Milano, Via Monte Napoleone, the most expensive street where all the big brands are, are sold. And um, to make uh, these, uh, uh, these stores uh, that were different from the 50 stores they already had, uh, Mr. Zhao um, um, chose uh, an architect, Claudio Silvestrin. I interviewed him in, uh, in Milano because he was uh, the uh, architect of all the shops of Armani. They just ended up their collaboration and Mr. Zhao said, okay, now you work for me and just for me. So there is in a way, it is an Italian brand in the sense that it has the heritage of the Max Mara where Mrs. Daolio uh, learned and also the stores uh, uh, have uh, uh, this uh, um, atmosphere. Um, and interesting, in 2018, they open the same kind of shops in Beijing and uh, Chicago. And always in 2018, they redecorated the, the, the store in Milano. And I, I found it interesting because they uh, called Milano Giada House Global Flagship Store. Okay, this is a picture, Mrs. Daolio, uh, Mario Boselli, who, was, uh, who is uh, uh, the, the president of the Camera Nazionale della Moda Italiana, and also he's in charge of the relationship between Italian and Chinese. Uh, Miss Lee and other people all uh, gather to this opening. Okay, but... Um, on the website, I found it very useful to do research on the website. Then they disappear. We, so it's interesting to take a picture of the website and then confronting because they change it all the time. So once it was described as a Sino-Italian joint venture, the Giada, then it became born in Italy. Giada is a luxury brand of modernity and elegance. And now, Giada was born in Milano, so again, it, they are reworking on the origins with the design ethos of minimalism, modernity, and elegance. So this is uh, at this point. We don't have time, but maybe in another occasion we can work on it. But what happened then? In 2015, the Italian designer Gabriele Colangelo was appointed creative director of Giada by both Mr. Zhao, <laughs> sorry, and Mrs. Da and Ms. Daolio to inject novelty in Giada collection because of course, uh, Mrs. Daolio has, has my age, uh, she's a work. Colangelo is really a kind of uh, hip designer. And uh, uh, so they, uh, they, now they have uh, everything. 
And uh, um, Colangelo used to travel to China four times a year to present the new collection to the company. Textile, <laughs> colors, mood boards were done in Italy and then it was developed and made all in China. Plus other trips for special events as this show in Chongqing on the 23rd of March in 2019, together with the same time at the um, cut workshop in Milano and at the same time in, in Chongqing. And it was quite an event, he said, I interviewed Mr. Colangelo. He said, one of the most incredible experiences in my life, he ironically adding that he finally understood how a rock star <laughs> might feel on stage. And, uh, um, but uh, what, why I'm telling you this, because the, the cosmopolitan is, is coming here because Colangelo's career was popular, but was just popular. So his career can be divided in before Jada and after Jada, because now since 2021, his own brand, because he also has a brand, he, he's, he designed for Jada, but he has his own brand has been produced in joint venture by Redstone and distributed at large in China. Needless to say, this is something that would never happen without the Chinese financial support. Mm -hmm. So you see the kind of changing of the relationship. Um, okay, I interview many others. So I can tell you that uh, this was not just one case. It's probably the most successful case, but every kind of relationships has this cosmopolitanism at its core for both, for Chinese and for Italians. And also in the case of failures, maybe it looks like a failure in Europe, but in China, it is not a failure because there are brands that have been bought by the Chinese and have a good, uh, uh, reputation in China, like Crizia, Curiel, or the Grass Studio. They're all other, like I can show to you some of the people I interview about uh, these brands. And interesting, uh, um, for me, this is very interesting. I would like to do more research on this topic. There is a new class of fashion practitioners now, international fashion practitioners, whose global experience is already mediated by an experience in China. So in the long run, this is going to further reshape Western designers' recruitment and, and careers. So it is not merely hybrided it between China and the West, but it entails a power dynamic between China and the rest of the world, where constant negotiation is expected and the culture and political context are at the core of, of uh, the making of, of fashion. So I would like to give you some uh, uh, conclusive uh, um, re remarks. So emblematic is the difference between the first joint ventures that I study, for example, the Charmoon that I showed to you between Xenia and the Chen brothers, and the elegant Prosper between the Miroglio and the Junk Poses, now defunct as expressions of last century, and the new ones, which are still called joint ventures, but they are sino italia collaborations of a new type, as is the case of Giada. In the beginning, the collaborations focus on the dichotomy between the material and the immaterial aspects of which fashion is composed. That is the creativity of the Italians and the executions by the Chinese. Today, the question seems to revolve around the quality and quantity of cosmopolitanism that a brand and designer manages to express. So to the three turning points I just described, the sourcing, the making fashion together, the branding, Perhaps we can add producing cosmopolitanism through fashion. A remark, we started with sourcing Italians who went to China to find cheaper products to make made in Italy and to sourcing in a certain way we return because now it's Chinese company that come to Italy to find the most suitable designers to make a Chinese made in Italy. Are they allied as in the beginning? I don't know. For sure, 
going global is a present day aim of both parties. To sum up, the making of fashion cannot merely refer to garment production and manufacturing. It is the prerequisite for a nation to participate on the global stage actively. For a country or a city, expressing a recognizable aesthetic has become an important corollary for the communication of political and economic strength. But being recognized as a North or country is part of a process in which the negotiation of national hierarchies and roles are constantly at play. So scrutinizing global fashion necessitates going beyond the assumption that fashion has a stable core and focusing instead on the dynamics of fashion that are key to its transformation. But the question is, can we still discuss national borders when discussing fashion? In what shared imagination do collaborations develop? What stereotypes are still at work? More than in the past centuries, fashion has been tasked with not only reflecting and representing social or individual needs, but also constructing at novel territories in which old stereotypes and imagination are creatively set free. Wesley Ling and I worked on these concepts in our edited volume, Fashion in Multiple Chinas, which also included a chapter by Pei Dong Son and Antonia Finanen. Unlike most production and commercial activities, fashion expresses an elaborate culture, a composition of symbols, ideologies, and lifestyle. The creation of hybrid forms, the fruit of a mixture of different ideas and traditions, represents the most interesting product of cross-cultural encounters. Existing narratives of fashion production have shifted in the wake of transnational reality toward a more complex picture of global interconnection. The research led me to ask what the term global fashion means, not the reception of a dominant system by a subordinate culture, of course, and not even a straightforward project. Rather, the construction of meaning in the interaction between cultural values and the objects circulating in, in culture. So probably global fashion can be considered a process more than a definition and a methodology to understand uh, global flows.